So uh, welcome to uh, the next in the series of artist talks that we've been hosting here at UNE. Uh, this is a part of the School of Social Work and our Applied Arts and Social Justice efforts and series. And it's uh, really exciting for me today because we're meeting a friend of mine, Jess Esch, who does social media for social change. It's quite inspiring. Um, I'll use the mic not for uh, projection, as you probably noticed, but to capture it for Dune. So if you have a question, we'll try to capture it. And Jess has promised that if I didn't quite get there fast enough, uh, she'll repeat the question and incorporate it in. So if you'll bear with us in that regard. Um, I don't think I actually promised. I said I'd try. You should try. Yeah. So um, be clear. There's a whiskey in it for you. <laughs> We're filming. I, I know. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> We're all over age, right? So um, I know what buttons work here. So <laughs> this is a good one. So Jess, um, go to town and inter right. interact and ask questions and uh, let me know if you need anything along the way. OK. Great. Great. Thanks. So just a little bit about me. My name is Jessica Esch. I grew up in Western Maine. Uh, I went to the University of Maine, where I studied journalism. I went to the University of Denver, where I studied mass communications and public relations. And then I came back, and I got a PhD in community at the United Way of Greater Portland. So I've been there for, I know you probably didn't know that United Way offered, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they were they, they, I gotcha. <laughs> they really, they, they don't. But it, it, that's what it was for me. I got a chance to learn the community from the ground up, what the issues are, uh, are and were, and who the players are in the community. And growing up in Western Maine, I didn't really know that there was this vibrant social network that actually was stitched together uh, with organizations to help people when they got in trouble. For me, in my small town, we did that just as a community on our own. So it was very eye-opening when I came to United Way and discovered that all these people were doing really amazing things. And um, so I started to learn what the community did. Um, let me try to figure out my, um, my way. So at United Way, um, so I was at United Way for about nine years doing community impact work, which was working with the volunteers to get the dollars raised during the campaign, which everyone usually knows us for, to get the dollars back into the community. And so, and that's just a volunteer driven process where I got to go out and meet the partner agency executive directors and see what the work was. And I also did public policy. So if you track back my nine years, it finds out that I started on September 10th, 2001. So it was a very interesting time to have your whole world broken open at the time when the whole world was broken open. Um, <clears throat> so after about nine years, I kind of figured out like what I wanted to really do. And it was a marriage of my, e my education, my formal education, and my education at United Way. And I had this idea for changing the way that United Way talked about the work. So you didn't, a lot of people know that United Way does good work, but you don't really know what that work is. So I thought that I was in a pretty unique situation that I could maybe help with that. So the result of that is the creation of the Library, the Live United Storytelling Library. So, um, what this was meant to be is a place where we could tell the story of like the like greater Portland, which I believe is the best place to live. Like I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I love it here. And through the library and telling it, talking about the issues and, and all those things, I thought that we could really have a chance of maybe cracking it open and saying, well, this, this is what's going on in your community. Aren't you lucky to live here? This is the best place to be. Here are some examples of that. So um, we intended it to be a resource. So we'd create these products. People would share them and like, that would like fix everything. <sighs> I might have been a little off on that. <laughs> so um, a couple of things before I kind of keep going and diving into this is that I think you've gotten a feel that I really, I think this is the best place to live. I love United Way because I believe that we are actually better together. And I believe that the small changes that you make and the choices that you make they change the world every day. And for me, there's like, the, often we put up these constructs of like, what's social justice and what is philanthropy and all those things. And I like to blow those doors off and kind of have a leveling of the playing field. And um, so 
I, don't, I do believe that every day you're making choices that change things, and I'm, that's what I'm doing on social media. Um, so I set the tone and the voice for United Way Online, and I'm going to talk a lot of United Way, and you guys might be thinking, oh my gosh, this is just a pitch for United Way. I don't want your money. I don't want, I mean, that would be fun later if you want to do that. That's fine. But for me, so much of what United Way is trying to do is what I am trying to do as a person. So while I don't really have a blur between what my work currently is and the art that I create there and the stories that I tell there, there is still a very distinct difference. And I'm talking you, to you today as me, and I might say something about some political thing or whatever that um, it's me talking and not United Way. So what I'd like to do is to give you a better idea of what uh, I'm talking about. I'm going to start off with the first video that ever came out of the Live United Storytelling Library and hopefully make this work. I did, like, at the time when the library first started, United Way made, as a pilot, let me do this for three months. So I drew it, I wrote the script, I, I, had, I recorded my dad doing it. I had no idea that audio was probably the make or break thing in a video. Like if you can't hear it or if the audio is bad, it's not, no one's going to watch it. And, and uh, Well, they might watch it, but they're going to be kind of like, that was kind of cheesy. You know, I kind of liked what you're doing, but it didn't really work. So what I love about this video, in addition to it being my dad, is that it introduced me to Susie Piker. And Susie Piker, at the time, was working for the Portland Press Herald. And uh, I, I reached out to a friend. And I said, I need some help. Do you know anybody that knows this software application? And they go, oh, I got the perfect person for you. Well, Susie just swooped in. She did her best that she could. and. Um, and got it to a spot where we could show the video and, and release it and have it make its impact. But then Susie and I hit it off. And I knew that you know, I could be going where I wanted to go, where I wanted United Way to go, if I had some help. And like somehow, like six months later, we made it happen. And like United, United Way, sometimes we don't really move that fast. Uh, and other nonprofits don't, but, but we made an investment. Uh, Suzanne McCormick's our uh, CEO, and she saw the potential of telling our own story, and, uh, and we went with it. So, so, I'd like to show you two more things, and then I'm going to dive into the social side of it, um, which is where it doesn't really, you don't have to make what I make. To, to kind of get the social and, and see how you can use social to make ideas spread. I hope I do not break this machine. So uh, I got to get out of this. The, bit, the other thing that's important about the Louvre is we're not trying to sell United Way all the time. You'll see that the things that we create are very minimal branding at the end, and they often don't include an ask. And the point of that is, is that we want them to be shared on social media, and the ask is going to change over time. And we don't want to make a video today and have it be outdated tomorrow. So we're going to create a, a video or tell a story that frames the issue, and then how you choose to put it out as our, 
as a partner agency, as a person, as an organization can change if the needs arise. So, and we try to keep them really short, so I think. So this one, we, um, Suzanne McCormick, our CEO, and Mark Swan, the CEO of Preble Street, gave a talk about homelessness in Southern Maine to the Institute for Civic Leadership. And we wanted to quickly get everybody kind of at least on the same page about what the issue was. So we made this to uh, start off the talk. Susie Piker and I, because you'll see the audio much better. See? <laughs> I told you. Do not break the thing. All right, so there is that. And then I think that you've, you've seen some of the other, hi. Um, so I don't know if, the, if everyone has seen this. This was the sketch notes that I did of the talk that Mark Swan and Suzanne did after. And it could look like, oh my gosh, why would I ever want to read that? It looks so complicated and cluttered. But you have to think that they spoke for about a half hour. So I simplified. I, I saved you some time <coughs> by doing it this way. And then that this allows us to, allows us and me to, I post those up on Flickr so they are anchored someplace. And then we use that link on Twitter and Facebook. Sure, I know, just fine. So then we use that to kind of draw people who weren't in the room to kind of help them see what happened in that room. Because we know that meetings happen all the time and important things are discussed, but we don't have any idea what went on. And it'd be very different if you could kind of get a glimpse of those things. <clears throat> so, um, and there'll be, I have one other example to show that we just um, updated and re-released kind of along the lines that sometimes you hear from people things that uh, sometimes people say things that aren't exactly true and um, so I created this image here because people often say that um, a lot of people are coming to Maine to get some assistance uh, so, and that assistance is, you know, the, it's welfare is what some people call it, but it's actually the temporary assistance for needy families, which is a federal program that comes down and, and Maine provides some funds too. But states set their own rates. So there's a lot of misinformation out there that says that w people are flocking here because we have such a rich benefit. And I created this image because it's... Um, I don't know about the flocking, but if they stopped in New Hampshire, they would get $190 more a month in this temporary assistance. 
So used an iconic sign that people are familiar with around here. And just to kind of hopefully kind of drive home a fact that uh, maybe what they've been hearing isn't necessarily true. So when I first started with the library and, and Susie and I started rolling, we thought, that's it. All we need is a couple products. We'll make these videos. People will send them out, share them, and like, it'll, things will change. And realize that it's not what the product is. It's just because you write a report doesn't mean like the report's going to change. People have to see that <coughs> report. So I thought my job was to create these things. And it turns out I spend much more time trying to get people to see them. And for that, I use social media. All right, so this isn't very attractive. Was it F5? Oh, gosh. Uh, let's see. So do the work and then let the work work for you. So um, one of the biggest challenges that I run up against is the fact that it used to be that you couldn't just take people's work and share it willingly. So where I realized that what we're asking people to do what kind of runs counter to what they're accustomed to. Because you, if you were writing a book, you couldn't just take someone's picture and put it in there. But social media is a little bit different. Social media is built for sharing. So if we create a, gra a, a video or, or I have an illustration that I put out there and you, sh you like it or you share it on Facebook, you're actually helping that artist in a way. You're not stealing from that artist. You're helping them get the word out about this thing that they created and this thing that you believe in. So, it's a constant challenge for me to just to kind of go around and go, use it. Just if you like that and you see it, you can link to it on, on whatever channels that you're on. So I'd like to kind of get a little bit of a feel for the room, like in terms of, are you guys on social media? And like, what platforms do you use? So how many of you guys are on social media? I'll give myself kind of a quasi half. And so what, it, when you're on it, what are you using? Are you using Facebook? Facebook, yes. Twitter? Yeah. Twitter's my favorite. <laughs> oh, I will talk about Twitter, because that's where I think that your, your change can really happen. Um, so, and if you're on social media, are you on it because you're, you want to be on it, you know, you're doing it for fun, or you're doing it because you're on for work? What? Doing it because sometimes that's the way you can find out what's happening in your family. Okay. Forced fun. <laughs> because that's the only way you can find out what's happening in your family. So. Yeah. So, you, okay, so that's a way that you can kind of find out and stay connected to what's going on, to the people that you know. Anybody else on it that they have to be on it for work? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I was just calling out that you're like a good UNE representative being on it. On it That's work. all. On it work. Um, how many of you make things that you share on social media? Things? And that, when I say make things, that's pretty broad because if you're writing a tweet, like you are writing. So there's all kinds of different definitions of content, and um, that, that's one of them. And how many of you on social media you share the other work, or are you pretty much liking and sharing? You share. I knew that. OK. So that's kind of good and helpful for me to know. Um, so I think about social media a lot, and I think about the connections of how like, to get things out and how you can use it to be more effective. I, I think about it so much that, I, and I didn't really have anybody to talk to about it, so I, I, I wrote a book for myself. And I, um, you could go to Longfellow Books and get that for $24.95 if it existed, but it doesn't. So I put it on Flickr, and it's free if you want to go there and see it. Um, and I'm also turning it into a Tumblr because it was my way of trying to figure out, like, I know I have a tribe out there. I know that I'm on to something. And I figured if I could put this out there for free and it could help kind of bring people along to where I am so I could get where I was going faster, 
That was much more valuable to me. You thought I was, wanted you to buy my book, didn't you? <laughs> I'm going to get you. <laughs> I'm pulling you to my side. OK, so, so that book is called Online Effects Offline. And it's done as a series of photographs. Um, and it kind of it looks like this on Flickr, which it's uh, set up like chapters. So I have a chapter on like these founding principles of what I believe for social media and how it can bring us together. Um, I, like if you're creating content, there's one on Facebook. There's this whole section on Twitter. It's like how to read Twitter. Uh, I'm going to actually read you a little brief part on that. How I handle photos and how if you're doing stuff on Facebook and you're uploading photos, and if you don't add names to those photos, like, that's just, it's gone in there. And it's the same way in your personal life. How many of you have digital cameras? When you download the photos, do you name them? Do you put the names on the back of you, on photographs? See, you're good. You don't need me, except I've got to get you online. But, <laughs> um, but there's all these things that if you take the time and you invest in it now, it's going to be able, you're going to pay off later. So one thing that I like about when I get to come out and talk to people is um, that I really have to think a lot about what I'm going to say so I don't sound like an idiot. But one of the discoveries that I had when I was preparing to talk to you was this idea of, of philanthropy. And I went back and I looked at philanthropy and I looked at the definition of Webster's and it says that uh, a philanthropist is a wealthy person who gives money and time to help make life better for other people. And I think that's hooey. I think wealthy gets thrown in there. And I think that means that if you give money anywhere, like that you're not a philanthropist. And I believe that if you give money, you are a philanthropist. And I also realize that I'm a digital philanthropist that I go, I click, I comment, I like, favorite, I tweet, I post, I share, all over the webs. And each one of those things is a vote for the world that I want to live in. And I give, and I give, and I give every single day. And if Forbes had a list of the top digital philanthropists, I would be on it. <laughs> and I'm my own foundation, and this is how I change the world, like clicking here, clicking there, clicking there. And what I'd like to do now is to talk to you about what I do and how I do it. So perhaps you could join me on that list. So first up, this is perfect timing. Come on in. All right, my little time check here. All right, how many of you have been told that like Marketing is somebody else's job, you know, that it's not your responsibility to get information out there that you believe in. You can rely on your communications department for that, or so your, your sister does it, or somebody else does it. I'm here to tell you that it's your work. And if you want something to get out there, you, you got to like do those things that make it happen. And you can never really underestimate your responsibility in getting your stuff out there and the things that you believe in. And to me, that's like the social justice part. Like, it, you have a voice, use it. I think I had this thing was up here for a little bit before. Um, but it's all about, like, you got to talk about what you believe in. And we're all kind of media channels now. Sorry, I chucked that. <clears throat> so, Facebook. It's the United Way again. Um, but I want to. Uh, I just want to talk about a couple of things with Facebook. So, so how many of you say that are on Facebook have liked your organizations or your, your businesses page or the places that you support on Facebook? Nice. So the way you do that, if you're not on Facebook or you haven't, is you click this button right here. And I would say that if you like what we're doing at United Way and what I'm trying to do there, go there and click this button for me. Like, and you might think that what does a like really do? Because it's just a click for you. But I want to tell you that if you're on the other end of this, if you're managing this Facebook page or you know with your own Facebook page, how does it feel when somebody likes your content? It's kind of like, oh, somebody saw me, somebody heard me. And, and, and 
when you're talking about an organization, you're like, what a difference does, does a click make? I know all the people who have clicked on this page for us. I get notified, I get their little picture, and I love them just because they took the time to do that. Because you don't have to be on Facebook to see the stuff that we're putting up here. It's not locked down. We don't do anything like you have to like this in order to see our content. We want you to treat this like a website and you can go here and find out what's going on in your community. And we're kind of working really hard that this is a place when you go there, you're like, oh, this is my community. I live here and, and this, is a, this is a good thing. So there's a couple of things that you can do if you're on Facebook to make it um, easier to, well, I don't want to say this. Do you know how to love the people that you love on Facebook? Because you, you're really using it, right? You're using it to stay in touch. So how do you love your people, your family on Facebook? I do you? you? Yeah. I'm not, your, I'm not a great example of a user because sure. I don't understand Facebook. Yeah. I go there and get uh, some little pieces of information, yeah. but I don't really understand how to use it. And, okay. and I find it very confusing. So. Well, then you're not going to like my part I'm on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, well, because see, all it is is that there's a like button underneath their status. Then you're loving them. But that, but that just means that, like, I saw you. Like, that is a big deal that you can say, I saw this picture. I was paying attention. Like, you matter to me. That's what a like is on Facebook. But what it also does is it goes in and it tells all the people that you're friends with that you like that person on Facebook. So it might not be as important in, you know, in the whole grand social justice scheme of things if you like that pretty dog photo, but if you like United Way on Facebook, it's going to tell everyone that you like United Way on Facebook. And other people might see that and go, oh, United Way, I actually like them too. And it's a way of getting information out there. So, but if you were posting on Facebook, and you were talking specifically to somebody, do you know how to tag that person to ensure that they see it? Use their name, right? Yeah, so you, use, you type the at sign, and then you can end up starting to type their name, and it'll come up so you can hyperlink it. So it's just one easy way of making sure that like, somebody knows that you're talking about them. Because otherwise, it's just text on there. You know, like. If you think Facebook's a fire hose, wait till you get to Twitter. I mean, there's just stuff coming in all the time. And you can make it easy for people to kind of sift through the things that they don't need to see so they can see the things you want them to see. <clears throat> yep? Um, does United Way pay for Facebook? Like, does do you not? No. Do you, no, you no. don't do a paid account. Yeah, uh, no. Does it a paid account? You can promote, you can buy oh. ads. We have done like a, a paid promotion once. I didn't really find that there was that much of a benefit to it. And I will say that we're much more interested in having you be there because you want to be there and, and, and having, trying to develop a relationship there than, um, than just, we don't want you just to like it and leave us. We want to like, this is your community. We want to show you here. Um, so likes or love points. Um, uh, and the other thing there is, I think that I'm set, actually. So I'm going to get into Twitter a little bit. And Twitter actually freaks people out because it looks like it's in a foreign language. But there are a couple of things that if you know about Twitter, like a quick primer here. I'm going to get to this in a moment. So what you need to know about Twitter where Facebook is a tool for um, who you used to know, right? Twitter is really for the people that you want to know. So in terms of me doing the work that I do and wanting to get the word out there about uh, the things that I believe in, I just realized what tweets were up there. Um, this is where I can 
talk to people that I should have no business talking to. I can talk to a novelist in England. I can talk to, I can make, I'm going to talk in a little bit about a connect that I made over the weekend um, with, for Kathy and, and stuff. It's just, if you, are, you can find the people that interest you and the subjects that interest you, and then you can build your community from there in a way that Facebook's kind of closed. You can't really build. Um, if you're going to make social change, here's a marker, that um, you got to talk to people that you don't know. So the weird thing about Twitter is that you're going to see an at sign. The at sign is any time that there's a word following this, this is a user on Twitter. It's a person or a company. That's me. Okay. So if if you were ever talking to me on Twitter or want about me, if you're tweeting about this right now, it'd be like listening to, if you say at Jesh30, I'll get notified that you mentioned in my name so that I could comment on it if I chose to. Okay? If you just said talking to Jessica Esch, I'll probably never see it because I'm not there searching for my name. Okay? Then you're going to see these things like these pound signs. So what is that? And that is there are two, it's a hashtag. And this is a way that you can either search for information on Twitter or you can um, use it to add a little spice to your comment, okay? To let, add a little bit of context to it. You know the emoticons, like when you send an email, that it's like the little colon and the smile? So, the same thing happens on Twitter. You could search those things, but they're really not going to get you anywhere. So you might see, like, like for the win. Um, but over here, if you were looking at this, you can see that, so this is my niece and my nephew. And I, I make up words all the time. Um, but, and I use a hashtag that says total jest joy. Well, you can click on that and see if anybody else used it, and I'd be shocked if anybody <laughs> did. But what I did here, because there's no real rules on Twitter, I did it to make sure that they knew what TJJ meant to me, is that it's total jest joy. So that's my way of sending some love my niece and nephew's way. Because Twitter, Instagram, Vine, uh, and Snapchat have allowed me to connect with my niece and my nephew in a way that I can't do on the phone that they don't have time for. Right? So it's actually, it's really uh, made a fuller uh, relationship there. So there's that. And then the other thing for Twitter is things look kind of like code here. And it's crazy. And that turn, people just turn right away from this. Like, what is all this gobbledygook? I can't click on that. Well, yeah, you can, actually, because it's just a URL. It's a link to a website. And Twitter has 140 characters. So if you were to tell, you know how sometimes URLs are like this long? Twitter, uh, these URL shorteners will shrink it to about 10 characters because you only have 140 that you can work with. So those are the, the big things. So, and if it ever starts with like an at sign, that is a conversation that I'm having with these people that you're free to look at. But it's probably not going to mean much to you. So when you're looking at the fire hose of things, you can just skip those things. Right. Right. If you wanted to see that, yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Can you explain the, the URL shorteners. Yeah. So for the <laughs> URL shorteners, so it's just a it's a software trick, so you know. It's a right? it's what. It's like an encryption or well. Uh, I'm trying to figure, like, yes, I'll repeat it. Let me figure out what my thought is. <laughs> so a URL shortener basically is taking a really long string of letter, a uh, 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 web address, and shrinking it down. So it's going to be like bit.ly is one that you can use, that you can sign in with your Twitter account, and it'll actually keep stats for you of who clicked that. Okay, and so it'll be like bit.ly jk4962, and that can that's only used by you, and um, and it's just you have to do something that shrinks those URLs or your whole 
tweet would be nothing but URLs. Okay, so you would create these these shortcuts on this other software. This like, this website. Can I That's give an it. example? It's a website. Can, so uh, uh, students created a book trailer for the book Out and Allied. And the URL on YouTube is wicked long, because yep. that's how it is. So we went to Bitly and um, asked, put in the link. We asked it to shorten it. And it gave something that was kind of gobbledygook, but uh, allowed me to go back in and change the letters. So I wrote OA, out and allied, trailer. So it looks like Oat Ailer, but yeah. OA trailer. And that is what's on there. And so when I send the link to people to s about the book now, that's what I send them and not the long the YouTube really long thing. Okay. It's completely free and when you go onto Bitly, you get your own sort of account, if you will. Um, and you can just continue to use that with some frequency. I think they make you sign in, don't they, Jess? They, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so you sign in with Twitter so it's very easy. And it's not another password that you have to remember. So if you did that, though, you can just, if you did that, you could tuck it into an email and yep. you would still get to that yep. point? Okay. Yep. Just like you'd insert a web address somewhere and say, hey, go look at my web page. Same idea. Yep, same thing. So I mentioned the, um, I wrote about why I think what Twitter is. So I was just going to take a moment after I answer your question. Thank you. Um, do you take stupid questions? Oh, yeah. Oh. We take a stupid answer? <laughs> uh, wh why? Why Twitter? Why do you use email? Oh, okay. What's the advantage? What's the advantage? Of, so for Twitter, and I'll, I'll actually get into that in this briefly, but you're t you can put something out there and then other people that you don't know can find it. In email, you can send an email out, but you're only going to talk to those people and maybe they forward it along. But if you want to try to have a bigger, broader impact, you got to reach those people that you don't know. And this is an opportunity to do that. And I'm not saying it's your only. Like we, I use to get my artwork and stuff out. I use Twitter. I'm in. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Flickr. I'm on Facebook. I will. I'm on Tumblr. I'll put my stuff anywhere because I want people to see it and see part of the world kind of the way I do. And so I'm willing to go wherever. Do you need a special machine? A computer. Yeah, because it's all done. It's a, you don't need a special machine. That was pretty good, huh? And, you know, it's just going to a website, and you'd open an account on there, and you could start, you could start going. And then there, you'd use those hashtags as a way to, to figure out, like, like the, the topics that you're interested in. You could search on those topics and find people that are talking about those things. Um, and then you might want to follow them to kind of, Build your audience. You have uh, when if you're new to f Twitter, be patient with it because it's meaningful when you find the people that are doing similar work. You, that takes time. A lot of people create an account on Twitter and then they're like, I don't get it. It's too much, and they're gone. And then they go bash Twitter elsewhere, saying like it doesn't work. It's not working for me. And it's just that. It's like anything. It's like any sort of network. You have to take the time and you have to build your community there. Can, yep. you, know, you want an example on that? Would that be useful at this point? Sure. Chris, do you, you've used it, right? Yeah. For examples with? Um, we use Twitter at the Center for Excellence in Interprofessional Education to connect with other interprofessional education folks throughout the country and Canada and England. So as the program coordinator there, I run the Twitter account. And we went to a conference, and I met a bunch of people. But I was sitting at the conference, and we were live tweeting what was happening at the conference. So we used a hashtag to say, we're at Cab 4 in Vancouver, only much yeah. shorter. And there were five or 10 other people who I maybe could identify because they were clutching <laughs> their iPhones closely. <laughs> but, right. And we were all tweeting things that we thought were important from the keynote speak, speeches, but we had that amongst ourselves as a little community, but also the hashtag allowed anybody in the world to follow the keynote speech at that conference without being there. And so I met people at the conference that I wouldn't necessarily have had a beer with, but now we're twi Twitter buddies. And also people from around the world started following me because I was clearly at the conference and they liked what I had to say about the keynote. How 
um, because we just we established it sort of happened organically yeah. but I think the conference itself put out what they preferred the hashtag to be and that was in our materials so we all used that yeah so it's a matter of like sometimes a conference puts out a Twitter uh, a hashtag that they that they think that they like to have it go but then this other one kind of comes along it's like with the Grammys the other night you never know like what the hashtag for the event's going to be and it turns out that it was just Grammys but I mistakenly use Grammys 2014 and like it, you know so some people might see that but everybody's using the other one and they're following that you can click it and you can watch it come up like your Facebook feed I actually did a time check and want to give you a couple more examples of uh, I'm going to you want to read my book you can read it online um, but I want to talk about this was a tweet that happened on Saturday uh, so my friend teaches a course in digital leadership and um, and because that's in Seattle and I'm in Maine I and I know that they're talking about it on Twitter I'm following the Twitter hashtag right and up comes this tweet that says you want to see a startup that came from media lab now you see that this is red because they this so that means I know that that is a user on Twitter and I can click on that and I can go right to their Twitter page and see what they're talking about and they said check out uh, another user blah 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 so I was feeling curious and I click on that and I open that up and there is this uh, gaming company for social change in Boston Massachusetts that they do kind of narrative games and I'm thinking ah oh, like I have to tell Kathy so I don't know if Kathy's active on Twitter at this time or not but I'm pretty sure she's on Facebook so I copy that link and I put it in notify her on you know email her on Facebook so she can see it then I go back in and I make a, a tweet back to this company that I don't know anybody at but I say you know you need to talk to Kathy Plord you need to talk to adverb about like what they're doing because this is like this is a great connect I use the hashtag two great orgs that taste great together or something like that is <laughs> silly you know but what you're trying to do is you're trying to create some content that's going to hook them a little bit too so they want to read so this kind of goes along and it works out well and I have an email in my inbox the next day like it's Kathy responding to them they come back to Kathy say we want to meet and I think you guys are going to meet next week yes we have a, a Skype call actually next uh, next Wednesday right. so we're really excited just to connect with them and I think because it came from you uh, I paid attention to it because I know that you're looking for things I know you know us and so there was a, a relationship that we've developed both personally but also online that Jess isn't going to send me crap she's not going to send me cute kitties um, or grumpy kitties or any of those stupid kitties I don't get kitties but but if some if she sends me something like this I'm gonna pay attention to it and so I think this is a terrific um, networking opportunity for us which I'm very grateful for. Well, do I have to repeat all that? <laughs> no but it's just, so that's one example there's um, this kind of look I blew this up uh, big I have uh, I've fallen in love with the New Yorker um, I find that it's the best writing that is out there and um, I was reading an article about Jennifer Weiner who writes uh, I guess what would be called like chiclet or something like that and she doesn't get a lot of credit but this article was talking about it mentioned that Jennifer Weiner is on Twitter and it's talking about how she's talking about gender and how it's not being um, you know people aren't really looking at her there's a double standard in the literary world and all this and then there was another reference mentioned to this organization called Vita um, lit where they're looking at um, the gender balance of communications and stuff like that and then um, well so I had to go on Twitter and say well it took me four columns to you know in this article written by the author was on Twitter at, so I used her Twitter handle and said by Rebecca Mead and about Jennifer Weiner and I know she's on there and I tagged the company uh, that they mentioned Vita and so then I was feeling bold because they both they all came back to me and they responded which is pretty cool and then um, so here I am having a conversation back with this 
published author that's very well known, a writer in the New Yorker in this company. I said, hey, just so you know, I track gender for fun in the published letters of the New Yorker. And I sent them uh, the total for 2013. So there were 108 male letters published, 47 women, and seven people. I didn't know who they were. Um, so what this has done is connected me. Vita is now following me. I have regular back and forth conversations with Rebecca Mead. And whenever I update my tally that I send out, uh, Vita retweets it. And uh, so I get uh, that exposure. So, I, so what I mean with a retweet is that if I tweet something out, it's that they share it with the people who are following them. So it's about legs, and it can go further and, and further. So there's that um, talking before about if you want to make your tweets go farther. Yep. How do you get followed? How do you, you provide like I, the way you can get followed in my eyes on Twitter is to be nice and you don't always push out your content. But if somebody makes a comment or like, hey, had a great day or I'm having a bad day, I'll chime in and be like, oh, you know, sorry to hear that or congratulations on this. And some it's you can. I don't think there's any magic answer for that. You go and you find, you might find out who else is on there. And if you're providing good content in tweets and you're either funny or helpful or providing some sort of a service, then you can, uh, they might choose to follow you. Can I add to that for a second? Yeah. So there's a search button at the top. And so you're interested in pain management. So you oh. write in pain yeah. management, and that will give you some options to, fo to follow. So it's, there's a little uh, search engine at the top of Twitter. And so yeah. ben, depending if you're interested in gender, type in gender. If women's writers, type those things in, and it will just generate content for you. So then you get the content. I thought following meant like some kind of automatic. Doesn't following mean that you automatically get some kind of content? Or it's just on that session where you are sitting there, yeah, I th I'm sorry. I think I confused it in my head. If you're looking at how do you get people to follow you, Either one, I don't yeah, because that I part is second. Because really, what you need to go out and figure out who do you want to follow, and you find your community that way because that's how other people are finding their community. So there, the thing that's different about between Facebook and Twitter is like Facebook. There's this thing that says, "Can will I accept your friend request?" You know, and there's none of that in Twitter. People come or they'll go at will. So you find who you like, you click the follow button, and then their information comes in your feed Automatic. automatically. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so if you want, if you're talking about a company on Twitter, and you always check to see if that company is on Twitter so that they have an opportunity to chime in. So I, I I was meeting Peg Libby at Kids First, which is a great local nonprofit. Um, they have a partnership with Coffee by Design. And this was my way of letting Coffee by Design know that th how they're interacting in the community and supporting the community mattered. And I was choosing them over other places because of that. If I didn't use their Twitter name and I just said Coffee by Design, they might not ever know that that was out there. But I know that they saw it because they favored it, which is a star button here. So, and a lot of times companies will take that and share it themselves as a way of kind of having other people talk about themselves. Um, I think about um, five minutes. Or so. Yeah, I'm actually almost done. Th this is all about if you want to be seen on Twitter. You, you know, put the time into your tweet, write for the retweet, try to make it interesting. Mains figured out how to warm up winter, hold the telethon for heating assistance. You know, and, and then there's a link to the, the page for the information about the telethon. Tagging channel six, cha tagging channel two, they retweeted it out and sent it to all their people. So it's about broadening the audience. There's just another one. Um, and when we send stuff out, kind of pairing it, like you mentioned, with email, right? Like, what do you do? Doesn't mean we don't use email anymore. It means that 
I use email strategically. Like, I'll go and we'll put up the video online or an illustration online and figure out who else needs to see it. And then I'll craft an email. I'll put a, if it's a video, I'll give them an idea of what it looks like. This is hyperlinked to the video, to the video itself. And you know, wanted to make sure you're aware of this short video and why it's important. We did it to keep things, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's just a way that because you post doesn't mean anybody's ever going to see it. So you got to try to do these things that tie things up. The, um, this is an example of this illustration that I did. It was an article in the New Yorker. I seem to have very good luck with women writers in the New Yorker. Um, but there was an article about domestic violence that, uh, that kind of profiled a, a nonprofit, the Jean Geiger Crisis Center in Boston. Um, so it was a very powerful article. And I thought, well, how can I help get this information out? And so I did a sketch note of it. I posted it online. I posted it in the different places. And then I tweeted. I know the author's got a Twitter page. And I didn't really hear anything. So I went offline, emailed the, the link and the, the picture to the Jean Greiger Crisis Center and to the author. And, um, and got back, they got back to me like within a short period of time, like within like 10, 15 minutes. And, um, and then shared it with the New Yorker staff, and, and I sent copies of them. When we went and published it up on United Way's Facebook page, by then I knew how to get a hold of the author, Rachel Louise Snyder, told her that it existed here, because how are you ever really going to know that? And, and then she ended up coming in, leaving a comment on the, the Facebook page. So like these things, you can't leave them to chance. you got to work it. Um, and, but that's, that's, that's what the fun so is. So unlike commenting about the weather or how you're not sleeping on Facebook, <laughs> you're offering that we find a way to create content that's interesting, that is of value, of service for people to know. And it's not necessarily self-promotion. And often yeah. I'm hearing it from what you're saying, it's not self-promotion. Uh, but it's a way to then connect people who care to this content so they can further their own mission. Right. So there's a, a loop that continues to go in there. Um, for those who think they have to spend their time on um, all of these accounts, um, no, you just have to register once maybe yeah. on all of them and then get onto something called Hootsuite, Hoot as an owl. And Hootsuite allows you to, do you use it, Jess? No. No, she likes them all. See, I can't do that. Well, and, no, it's only because, and I think that you don't have to be on all of them. You have to find one that works for you. If you like Facebook, use Facebook. I love Twitter. That's where I'm going to be because that's where I can build, build my audience or build my crowd or in my tribe, and then I can find new things and, and all that kind of stuff. Twitter's not for everyone. Yeah, we've used Hootsuite because it's helpful to, for not everybody's on Facebook, but we still yep. want them to know. Not everybody's yep. on Twitter, we still want them to know. So it's yep. a way for you to hit send yep. once, and it yep. hits all of them. You those. can definitely do that. I think there are other programs as well that yeah. do that. I think Hootsuite's pretty much the, the, the good one. And I think they, they have great analytics, too, which is really good. That's one of the things that we're working on, trying to figure out how do you, um, how do you measure what you're doing, and how do you show that it's worthwhile. Are there comments, people, things you want to say? Please use the mic. Question. You talked about uh, filtering Twitter at early in, earlier, and it seems like it would be easy just to be overwhelmed with the content. So how do you deal with that? Um, the way that I handle the fire hose of Twitter is that I create these things called lists. And then I have one list that are people and Twitter accounts that I don't want to miss. So like my niece and my nephew are in there. My husband's in there. Just got to make sure you keep that. So every tweet that's not a reply. I'll see it in there. And then I have another list, which are people that I consider important um, and that I'll, I'll track in there. So, and then I'll go to my bigger news feed and, and get everything there. Thanks. Yeah. I just was wondering if, um, since you made the videos and the creative library and all, if other branches of United United Way have started to sort of adopt that idea, or will you be making things for other states, or are they, you know, I mean, it just seems like 
everybody, should, all of all of United Way should do it then. Right. Well, I think what we're finding is that the when we create new things, our hope is that we're keeping them generic enough that they could change their messaging around the front, that they wouldn't have to invest the time and the energy. You wouldn't have to have Susie Piker on staff to be able to do all the audio and the video stuff, or you wouldn't have to have me there drawing the illustrations. That you could say, this is pretty much what we're doing here too, with the exception of this. Um, we did have a, a, this, another video that, um, um, that we did that you might have seen around. It's called the Aspire video, and it's all, it's, I have it queued up that you can show it if anyone wants to stick around. But we had a number of companies or United Ways that chose to make their own video. So uh, using painfully like the same song and stuff, but doing it their own way. And, and that's fine too, but we're, we know as a nonprofit that like time is limited. So you, know, you can make your own and do it, or you could just share this one that's already done. Um, but flattery is always good you know, when they, they do that. So did you have another question? How much time do you spend on social media sites? On social media sites? Oh, to get, I, that's like, it, it depends. Sometimes I can dive into a, a rabbit hole when I'm looking at different social media sites and, um, and I can be lost in there forever or I can just pull myself out. I've been on it long enough that I know I can't keep up. So I don't even try to anymore. I know that I'm gonna miss stuff and I miss stuff. And the really important stuff I'll see if somebody will put it in front of me. So I kind of, that's another way that the, your community on Facebook and on, on Twitter and all those things kind of support you in that, that they help you find what's important. I'll or maybe you, not what's important, but maybe what's kind of funny. Can I tell you a secret and then I'll give this to Kath, uh, Kathleen. Uh, one of the ways I started my Twitter account was I went to Jess's mm -hmm. and I saw who she was following oh, and yeah. I just stole those people. Yeah. Because I thought, oh, if she, right, 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 right. So, Go to, you don't have to do all the work yourself. You can really look for those people who can, you connect with and whose work rhymes with yours and bring them in as well, you know, follow their list. I do that all the time. Well, and it's, it's great, because it's a way that you can figure out like who's, who's doing interesting work that I don't know about. Who's on Twitter that I don't know about? So it, there's a lot of people on there that you, you just don't know that are on there until you look. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, I do, I manage the Twitter account for Maine Women Writers, and I um, am doing I have a personal account and another account that I manage. And I'm one of the struggles that I have with social media, and I feel like I'm maybe holding back too much, is the um, intersection between personal and work. Yeah. You know, and what I see people do on Twitter is it's like a really big mixture, and I've been like kind of I hold back a little bit as at Maine Women Writers because I'm like, well, that's my own personal thing. Do you have any comments or thoughts about that? I think it's a balance. I think um, it's a challenge when you have your own Twitter account and then you're handling multiple, I, I, I handle like four. So there's a kind of a schizophrenia that kind of comes in there. Um, and I've tweeted on the wrong ones. That's awkward. Yeah. <laughs> that <is> awkward. <laughs> um, but it's, I do believe that if you're main women writers on, you have to have a personality on there and you can't, like they, people know that there's a person behind it. And I think it's good to have a flavor of that person. Um, and, but it, I don't have a perfect recipe there, but I would say that you could let yourself be in there more. One of the things we're trying to do on United Ways is just to kind of give a shout out to um, United Way staff and try to use it as a way of bolstering how they feel about working about, at United Way. So we have a hashtag called Best Staff that, you know, if, if some of them are on Twitter, we can shout them out that way, or we can just say that if, if so-and-so isn't on Twitter, we'll use their name and say what they did and do hashtag best staff. But I, I think an organization is made up of people and I, I think it's okay to let people know that, that that's true. I think they like you more. 
Great. Well, I think we're at about time, so uh, I'll just formally wrap this. If you want to talk to Jess a little more, yep. you want to talk her into seeing her Aspire video, we can do that. But thanks for coming. And we have more talks scheduled. The next one I know about is March 11 and March 13. And the 11th is Danielle Wozniak, the director of the School of Social Work, doing a piece on uh, arts and healing. And uh, the next one will be Arla Patch coming back in. She'll talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Project. And we've got tons more coming. And a little plug for our Arts and Health Mixer, February 19. If you want to know more, come find me. Okay, thanks so much, Jess. Thank you. Thanks.